So the message today, I don't often have titles, but it's this. The Gospel According to Obed. The Gospel According to Obed. And my goal, my mission today is to help us reclaim vision for what life is like in Jesus. When we have vision, we can aim and then we can re-aim as necessary. We can re-aim our lives in the direction of that vision. But when we lose sight of what we're actually doing here, that's when it's liable to become something other than what God intended it to be. If you found yourself there before, what am I doing here? Why, what's my purpose? Why am I following Jesus? Why am I gathering with people? It becomes something that's there in our lives, but we don't, re- we don't know how to engage with it in the way that God desires us to. And in that space, when we lose sight of it, that's the space where distractions become pretty frequent and disruptive in our lives. We start to respond to things that are happening in the world and around us in unhealthy ways. Can you find yourselves there for a moment? Maybe sometime in your past, maybe that's your present, when we lose focus on what we're doing and then distractions and fatigue just get in so easy. And then in that, the blessing that's inherent in a life laid down in surrender and submission to Jesus becomes lost on us. Did you know that following Jesus is a blessing? And the life of someone who is in surrender and submission to Jesus should look very, very blessed. Can I be Mr. Obvious this morning? but I'm doing so on purpose. This, this week has been an interesting one for me in that story after story after story of, of church leaders and churches just going through weird stuff. Like, I, and this is not a, a place of judgment. It's just a place of how, how do we get here? How do we get to the place where the thing that Jesus designs this life and life in abundance in his people is nowhere to be found sometimes? In fact, it's the off- opposite. You ask yourself, that, how did we get here? That moment when you gave your life to Jesus, you're encountering his presence. It's like, could life be like this every single day? And you're like, yes, it can. I give my life to you, Jesus. And then it's not as vibrant and vigorous as it once was. But I wanna reclaim today a vision of what life is like in him through the gospel, the good news of Jesus. I wanna speak to you today about one of the most low key influential people, most influential people in all of Israel's history. His name is Obed-Edom. And I pray that today you and I would get a fresh vision for who we are in God's plan for what he wants to do in the world around us. Can you guys say yes to that? Yes. Okay. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your spirit in us, amongst us. Lord, we just open our hearts. We yield ourselves to your spirit. For you to do whatever you wanna do, we submit ourselves to the truth of your word. We desire to worship you in spirit and in truth. So do something in us and amongst us today that we're longing for, that we're so hungry for, and for some of us that we didn't even expect. For those who are far off from you, God, draw them near today. So we bless you, Jesus, as King, as Lord, as Savior, as friend as the source of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Sam. You are dismissed. <laughs> so Obed-Edom, 
Obed-Edom's story is found in a couple places in Scripture, but particularly what we're going to press into today is 1 Corinthians chapter, I'm not Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, they're close, okay, give me a break, 1 Chronicles chapter 13 and 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to get this. And the context of this man is, is David, who had just become king, recognizes that the presence of God that being the Ark of the Covenant, is not in, in, under his care. It's not in Israel. In fact, it was being held captive by the enemies of God. They released it, but now it's in this home of a guy named Abinadab. But David, with a man who's, as a man who's after God's heart, he says, we got to go get the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant that has been so central to Israel's history. We need it back because there's blessing in God being central and center in his people. And so he goes and gets this ark and he takes a bunch of people with him. It's this big party and big celebration. And it says in scripture that he puts this, this ark on a new cart and it's pulled by an oxen. And so you can imagine all these people, this big parade, this big party to bring the presence of God back into the center of his people. And I've preached through this many times before, but ultimately what happens, if you, if you read those two portions of Scripture, it says that the, the, the oxen stumbled, the ark fell, and this guy guiding it named Uzzah tries to stabilize the ark, tries to bring security in this situation. So he touches the ark, and it says because he touched it, God struck him dead. The holiness of God killed him. And so this ripples through Israel. It's like this messy, tragic time. And David's like, wait a minute. I didn't know that was going to happen as a result of me bringing the ark back in. But because it happened, it says David got really, really angry. He was upset. Like, God, why did you kill this man? Like, we're just trying to do what we thought you wanted to do. And so as a result of this mess and disruption, David's like, listen, I can't, I can't deal with this ark anymore. Like, I love you, God, but I just don't know how to manage your presence in a way that's not going to harm people and destroy people. So I'm going to go put it in some dude's house named Obed-Edom, our central character today. And it says that the ark stayed there for three months. So let's pick it up. Let's read 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 12. It says, David was afraid of God that day. I would be too. Would you not be afraid? Afraid of God that day and asked, how could I ever bring this ark of God to me? He did not, and he did not take the ark to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months. And the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. So anytime you hear me say ark or you see ark in scripture, think presence of God. It's the presence of God. It says that the presence of God dwelt between the cherubim on the ark, right? And so we now have the presence of God in us, and the presence of God dwells amongst us. But in this time before Jesus, the ark was the presence of God among his people. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12, it says this, Now King David was told the Lord had blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Look at that turnaround. I can't have this thing close to me. Then he hears that his blessing Obed's house and all of his family. And then David says, I got to have this thing. I got to have the presence of God. So then he didn't, he wasn't angry about it anymore. He wasn't frightened about it anymore. He brought it up with rejoicing. So here we see in this passage of scripture that Obed, Edom and his family His family reframed the people's perception of God, starting with the king, King David, that the presence of God was not a burden. It was actually a blessing. 
There was reformation in the entire nation as a result of how Obed-Edom stewarded the presence of God in his home with his family. Wow. And because of that, the presence of God became central again in Israel. So as I said, Obed-Edom was quietly one of the most influential people in Israel's history, simply because of how he stewarded the presence of God in his home. I should put the mic down and walk away right there. This is you. This is me. This is us. You wanna talk about influence in this age? This is real influence. How he hosted the living God in his life and it reframed the perception of God to the most powerful person in all of Israel's history, the one whose heart was after God. Obed-Edom was the man, by the very example of his life, changed the opinion of one man in an entire nation about who God was. Boom. I just want to like let that rest for a little bit. It says that Obed-Edom was a Gittite. Do you know why they, the writers of scripture put in Gittite in there? Well, Gittite, he was not an Israelite. He was not a chosen one. He was not one that was part of the fold. Because he was called a Gittite, it indicates to us that he was this, from this place called Gath. And if you've heard of the place called Gath before, you recognize it because there was another man from Gath, and that man was named Goliath. So Obed-Edom was like the same family as Goliath, from the same place. And if you know Goliath, he postured himself with all of his people, the Philistines, against what God was doing. This wasn't just someone who wasn't part of the fold. This was an enemy of God by nature of his inheritance. He was an enemy of God, and David's like, this ark is scary. I'm going to put it in that dude's house. <laughs> Obed-Edom, the Gittites. They would taunt God, these people. I don't know this from the scriptures or from history, but I'm willing to bet that Obed-Edom was present in the crowd for those days that Goliath would come up and taunt King Saul. And if he wasn't in the crowd, then surely he knew about it. They would laugh at God's people. They would insult God's people. The Obed wasn't some prodigy with a pedigree set apart to take care of God's presence. There were those people. They were called the Levites. Obed-Edom was far from that. Can you imagine... David's rationale for sending the ark to Obed-Edom's house. I don't want any more of my dudes to die. I loved Uzzah. If anybody's going to die, I'm okay with him dying. Like that was his perception of the presence of God. It's liable to strike someone dead. So Obed, your house, go. I'll drop it off at this dude's house and say, good luck as I close the door on the way out. He was an outsider. He was an outsider of God's covenant chosen people, but he was able to receive the presence of God and not only not die, he was blessed because of it. Oh, this is the gospel. This is the good news. Oh, I want you guys to get as excited as I am. That's my goal this morning. So David, I believe, I've never seen it this way before, but David, through the example of this man's life, was now getting a prophetic glimpse of what was to come in Jesus. 
David wrote all of these messianic psalms about who the Messiah was. Do you think for a moment he saw who Jesus was through this man's life, Obed-Edom? That Jesus wasn't just after the Jews, he was after all humanity? And then David would write about that in the Psalms and it would be a mystery to people. But now that we see Jesus, we're like, oh yeah, that's what David was talking about. Through this experience, this is good. The example of this man's life, David got a glimpse of the coming Messiah. That he wasn't just after his people, he was after all people. Look what it says in Ephesians 2. Remember that at one time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners, Philistines, Gentiles, to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you once who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Something kept this man from being destroyed by the holiness of God. David saw Jesus before Jesus through this man's life. I'm shaking up here. The only thing that David could do was conclude that the holiness of God was not a burden, but the holiness of God was a blessing. The gospel according to Obed. And it was not just a blessing for Obed, it was a blessing that he needed. And it was a blessing that the nation needed. So once David saw that God was not just blessing his chosen people, he was blessing this far out and away Philistine He said, no, 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 wait, 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 I need that. And so does my nation. We're all in need of this blessing. He learned that through this simple man who did not deserve what he inherited, but simply received it and was blessed by it. He learned the nature of God through this man. And the blessing wasn't just random, though. Remember that the very ark killed Uzzah. It wasn't just random that him and his family were blessed. It killed Uzzah three months before. So what is God doing here? Is he playing, I love you, I love you not? I love you, I love you not. Is it random? Like did God wake up and have a bad day one day and then he was in a good mood the next? Like good good mood, bad mood? God? No. There were ways in which God ordered things. He prescribed the way his presence should be stewarded. And there's a lot here, and I preached through this a lot before, and we're going to leave it. But there was order to the way God prescribed his presence be taken care of amongst his people, But through this story and Obed being blessed, we can assume that he stewarded the presence of God well. That he took care of this ark in a way that actually pleased God. And because he did that, his life was blessed as a result. And we know, you and I, here today, and if you don't, let me tell you and remind you that the presence of God lives in us by the Spirit. And His presence dwells among us here now as we gather. But remember that this time, His presence was in an ark. And the ark was a big piece of furniture massive piece of furniture. Think of this piano and even bigger. Wasn't just this spirit that we have here and here. It was a big piece of art. And stewarding the presence of God in that time was stewarding this big piece of furniture. 
So what do you have to do when a big piece of furniture moves into your house? You got to rearrange the contents of your home to accommodate this big piece of furniture, don't you? Some things can stay, but some things got to go. But everything, whether it stays or it goes, lives in reference to this knit new big piece of art that just moved into your house. And Sarah and I and our family, we just moved into a new house and we ordered a couch, but the couch was going to take months to come. So in that, this big piece of new furniture, we decided to wait. We're not going to fill our house with stuff until we get this couch in. Because the couch is this kind of centerpiece that we want to decorate around. So this ark moves into Obed-Edom's house, like right into his house. Not a barn, not a stable, not a tent that was outside. It says it moved into his home. And that home was previously occupied. But in order to steward this ark in a way that did not kill him, he had to make space for it. In this, we start to see then the paths between blessing and burden start to diverge. Maybe the presence of God, the blessing of it, isn't just being in us, but also our response to his presence. Let me say that again. Maybe the blessing isn't just his presence in us, but also our response to his presence in us. The scriptures tell us that his righteousness is imputed to us, which means this, he receives your sin, your brokenness, your shame, everything you've ever done wrong, everything you will do wrong. He receives it, and in return, by faith and faith alone, he gives you his righteousness. We become the righteousness of God simply by faith in him. This is the ark showing up at your door, knocking on it, saying, I want to live here. But wait, I'm a Philistine. Wait, I've done these things wrong. No, no, I want to live here. It's okay. Will you receive me? This is how Jesus pursues us. I want your life. I'm going to knock on the door of your heart. Can I come in? Jesus, I got all these. No, no, no. I took care of that stuff. I'm coming in. And we now are righteous because of his presence in us. That is his imputed righteousness. Your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus, simply by receiving forgiveness and believing in his work on the cross. We become the righteousness of God. And Jesus says, I want to live in you. But I'm sinful. I don't deserve this. Do you know what I've done, Jesus? And he says, yes, I'm coming to live there. And you are no longer an outsider because of my blood. Do you believe in what I've done for you? If the answer is yes, I'm coming in. Is there room for me? Yes. Okay, I'm coming in. Great. I'm in. I took care of everything. Don't worry about it. That home, your life is righteous holy and blessed simply because he lives in you. But that is just the beginning. What happens next is the difference between Uzzah and Obed, blessing and burden. We are made righteous because of his righteousness, and we are made holy because of his holiness, but we're still called to pursue holiness and righteousness. And if we do that by the letter of the external law, like we think it's about pleasing the pastor or pleasing the church crowd or trying to fit into a religious structure or organization, that pursuit of righteousness will be like death to you. The scriptures say that the law brings death, but there's something else that brings life. The spirit of God brings life and liberty. So if we pursue righteousness and holiness according to the spirit, the scriptures tell us that is life and life in abundance. 
The pursuit of holiness and the pursuit of righteousness is blessing and not a burden. How do you guys feel? So if we pursue righteousness and holiness by the Spirit, it's exactly like Obed rearranging his home in reference to the ark. The Spirit of God moves in, and we start to live our lives in reference to the Spirit of God in us, arranging our lives around His spirit dwelling in us. This is what it means to be holy as he is holy. To seek first his righteousness. So his whole household now revolved around the presence of God in his home. We are righteous and are still becoming righteous as we live in reference to the Spirit of God in us. Paul says this, keep in step with the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Live according to the Spirit, and it will keep you from going down that path. He also says, find out what pleases God. Find out what life living in reference to the presence of God looks like. Go on the relational journey of finding out what makes him smile. And then build your life from that place. He also says, you've heard this from mom before, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. So Paul's talking about Jesus lives in you. So whatever you do in your life, do it in reference to the one who lives in you. I'm preach. I'm getting ready to preach. Thank you. <laughs> Peter says this in Acts chapter three, verse twenty-six. He's preaching the gospel after he just performed a miracle at a gate named Beautiful. He says this: When God raised up His servant, that being Jesus, He sent Him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This is repentance. The blessing that comes through repentance. The presence of God moves into your life. And as we live in reference now to the presence of God in us, the indwelling spirit, he draws us away from our wicked ways. And as a result, our life is blessed. This is the blessed life responding to the one who died to make a way so that you and him could be one by his blood and now living from that place, turning from wicked ways is what is actually the blessing of following Jesus. Amen? Amen. The blessed life is rearranging your life in reference to the living Holy God taking up residence in you. I know you're in me, Jesus, by no merit of my own. Jesus, you did it all. But now that you're here, and now that I'm yours, how can I honor you? How can I live in reference to who you are in me? So if it's a blessing to turn from our wicked ways, then how come we all just don't do it? There's a conflict. The conflict is between the spirit and the flesh. If we try to hold on to what the flesh wants, then it's gonna be a tug of war with what the spirit wants. That's why Jesus gave us the answer from the beginning. He says, come and die. Give up your life. 
He doesn't mince his words here. He doesn't play around. He doesn't say, hey, come let me show you what blessing is, but I'm going to give you the punchline later. No, he says, come and die so that I might walk you into blessing as you turn from your wicked ways. But many of us don't begin there. Many of us don't understand that as we follow Jesus. And so we have this tug of war in our walk with him between what the flesh wants and what the spirit wants. And the reason why God is inviting us to die is so that we can arrange our lives around his holiness so that in turn, our lives would be blessed. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Come and die. Give up what you think is blessed so that I can show you what real blessing is. Last night we had some friends over at our house and they're our Brazilian friends. And so me and Sarah were at, um, at Whole Foods and we were just going to buy some stuff and I was going to get some tortilla chips and some salsa, good Latino home over here, honorary member of the Latin community. <laughs> we're going to serve appies. It's going to be uh, tortillas and chips and salsa, right, David? And so I look and we're having Brazilian friends over, right? So I see this bag of tortillas and, and the branding on the bottom is Carnival. And if you know Carnival, it's a, it's a Brazilian holiday, right? So I'm like, oh, this would be amazing. I'm going to get this bag of chips called Carnival for my Brazilian friends. It's going to be a great host, right? And I'm like, oh, this is probably not a good thing, but I, I did it anyways. I show up, and they're like, yeah, actually, uh, Carnival is not uh, a good thing to us who follow Jesus. <laughs> because Carnival is literally this celebration of the flesh. Carne means flesh, the celebration of the flesh. And that's the tug of war. That is it, where the flesh and the things we want, the, the things that we desire is what comes up against the things that the spirit wants and the spirit desires. Paul tells us that the spirit and flesh are at enmity with each other. They're in opposition. And so we have this model in Obed that, that shows us what it looks like to move through that in our lives to understand the indwelling nature of God and start to arrange our lives around not what pleases us, but what pleases him. The scriptures say that the heart is the most deceitful thing. If you follow your heart, it feels good. It's like, I'm gonna buy those tortilla chips because I wanna bless my friends. But ultimately, I'm just perpetuating the celebration of the flesh. Many of us say to God in the invitation of him coming to our lives, here's a room in my house for your presence. I understand that you want to take up residence in my house. I got this beautiful room for you over here so that I can say that you live here and I can know that you live here and come knock on your door if you need anything. But that's not what happened in Obed's life. Obed said, this house is no longer my house, it's your house. I'm going to rearrange my life and my family's life around your presence. How would you live if Jesus was your roommate? Hint, hint, he is. <laughs> it will cost you. It's going to cost you everything. Because it's no longer your life, it's his. But we see the punchline here. We see the end game here that your life will be blessed into abundance as a result. Can anybody attest to this? Yes. Oh, I have so much faith that God is just going to pour out in this room. Will you guys partner with me in that? Yes. You guys are a tough crowd to preach to today, but I'm excited. Look at the context and how Obed-Edom receives the ark, the presence of God. Uzzah was dead. David was angry. The entire scenario was a big mess. They didn't know what to do or how to handle it or how to stabilize it. And that big mess comes over to Obed-Edom's house and he says, okay, I don't know if I have a choice here, but you're going to live here. And what happens in the middle of that mess is this man named Obed takes responsibility for the mess and says, okay, you guys have mishandled what's going on out there, but as long as the ark is in my house, 
As long as I have stewardship over this presence, I'm going to do it the way that I know leads to blessing and not to death. I think oftentimes we want things tidy and tucked in and ordered. But more often than not, God moves into situations that are jacked up and looking for someone to receive him as he is and believe that he will do what he said he will do. Obed-Edom took responsibility for what people thought was the source of the mess. How many of us have looked at the church, the carriers of the presence of God, and said, ah, it's messy? And Obed-Edom said, okay, don't worry about that. I'm going to receive you not who, through who they say you are, I'm going to receive you as you are. Invited God into his house, revolved everything around God in his house, and as a result, him and his entire family were blessed. Amen. It was a mess. But this word responsibility usually has a negative slight to it, doesn't it? Like take response, young man, take responsibility for your actions. Responsibility kind of denotes this burden or this weight that we have to carry. But if you look at the root of this word, even in English, the Latin et etymology of this word, it, it literally means something offered in return. Your, your ability to respond to what's in front of you. And so Obed-Edom literally took responsibility for this mess. It said the response that is here is not going to be in reference to what you guys have done with this. My response is my response. Taking responsibility for the presence of God in his home was him offering something to God in return, rearranging his entire life around it. I'm convinced that we as followers of Jesus need responsibility. We have a part to play in how God wants to express himself in this world. You need responsibility in God's plan for this world. The greatest thing you can do with your life is take responsibility. Don't hear blame when I say that. Not take blame for the things that have happened to you or the things that other people have done. Take responsibility, which is your ability to respond to whatever is coming your way. Your responsibility is your ability to respond to who now lives in you. I live in reference to you, Jesus, not my pain, not my sin, not my brokenness, not my shame, not my disqualification, but the fact that I'm no longer a slave to those things because you have your residency inside of me. And that's what I'm going to respond to. Not the mess that other people have made, not the pain of my past, not this addiction that I haven't been, get, been able to get over. But now that I'm set free by the blood of Jesus who lives in me, I will respond to that and that alone. That is my responsibility. I will live in reference to that place for who the son sets free is free indeed. Obed-Edom is showing us what it looks like to live in the blessing of Jesus in us. He took responsibility for the living God moving in. He could declare that he was set free from all that pain, all that mess because of him. The Christian life boils down to two things. God's pursuit of you. Him showing up unexpected at your door, knocking on it, saying, I want your life. I'm going to live in you. His pursuit of us and then our pursuit of him. That's it. Sometimes you're going to feel like he's chasing you down. And you can't help but like 
This is amazing. This is so good. Like God's love is just being poured out on me. And then you're going to have times where you feel like he's distant. Well, guess what you get to do in that moment? Understand the truth that he's not distant. He's in you, but it's now your time to pursue him. Because you rightly understand that his presence is in you by no merit of your own, just because he loves you. And he chose you before the foundations of the world to say, he's mine, she's mine, and I'm going to die, shed my blood so they can receive me. So the Christian life is lived in response to that reality. And the only proper response to that reality is to live our lives in reference to that reality. Jesus, come. Liberate your people. To Obed-Edom, he received the presence of God. He rearranged his life around the presence of God. And then he displayed the holistic blessing of living from the presence of God. So much so that his family life shifted the heart of the most influential king in Israel's history. And the presence of God was brought back into the center of the nation. This is true influence. The nature of God revealed through your story. You guys are nodding at me like this is some intellectual, like, uh aha. The nature of God revealed through your life. I don't want to hype you up, but I hope the Holy Spirit does. This is the call to live for his glory, for his renown. But that happens as we fully surrender our lives into his care and boldly put our lives on display for his glory, not our own. Obed-Edom shows us that what works in the home works in the nation. That we get to say as followers of Jesus, the reason I've laid my life down to proclaim his good news is because it worked here first. How many of us are feeling the weight of this right now? I want to see hands. Is there something stirring in your heart? A lot of the focus of our time, of our day and age, is trying to get God to do something out there. When God is really, really interested in doing something in here, in your home, in your life. And what we get to do as followers of Jesus is proclaim that I believe with my entire life and my entire being that he is the hope for humanity is because he's the hope for my home, for my life, for my family. The deepest call of my life is actually not here. It's not to you. It's not to the city. The deepest call of my life is to my union with God. And it's then to my family. And it's to declare not just with my lips, but with my life, his nature. And you know why I can boldly declare that it's going to work out there? Because it works right here. I can stand up here and proclaim his goodness. And I don't have to ask you to believe my lips. I can open up my life and say, look, God did it here. He can do it there too. God did it in me. God did it in my wife. God did it in my family. God did it in my finances. God did it here. 
as I rearranged my life around his call and his pursuit, he said, Ryan, do you want what I have? Yes, fine. Okay, now rearrange your life around what I have given you in Jesus. And as a result of that, all I can do is proclaim that the blessing of God is real. Okay, fine, I will hype you up. Let's go. That's the call. It's to him first. Is his presence real in here? And as you live according to it, does it bless your life? Yeah. Yeah. Then allow your life to be put on display for his glory. This is the gospel that he wants to show the world how good he is through how good he is to you. Enough of this. Look how God good. Look at how good he is over there and what he wants to do over there and how good he's been to them. And look at how good he is in here. Yes, that's all true. But what about how good he is in you? I'm telling you, the overflow of blessing is at your doorstep. As you live in reference to the holiness of God who is in you, it's going to shake your life up. It's going to reorder and arrange so many things. But as a result, you will live in overflowing blessing and people's heads will turn and say, how did you get that? How did you do that? The most influential people in the land will say, I need what you have. Bring it over here. This is the Christian way. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. It works out there because it works in here. That's the call. It's to him first. It's to know him and who we are in him. So many, so many times I've heard in my life, don't preach from your experience. Don't preach from your interpretation of who God is. But I'm going to tell you today that I'm going to unashamedly proclaim his goodness from my experience of his goodness. Obed-Edom was just this dude who God said, I want to live in your home. And he said, okay, fine. Rearranged his entire family around the presence of God. Lived in holiness. Empowered by the presence of God. Three months later, revolutionized an entire nation. Could this be what God has called his church to? That as we live according to his presence in us, it can't help but shake up everything. And if we're not living in a world that's being shaken by the presence of God, where do we look? Is he impotent? No, he's all powerful. We got to look at his plan for humanity, which is his church. And that includes you and me. Will you allow your life to be blessed by the presence of God? Will you allow your life to be rearranged by the presence of God? What are the things in our lives that say, God, I want it my way, not your way? What are the things that say, I I don't want to take responsibility for you being in my life right now? I'm going to respond to my ego. I'm going to respond to my emotions. I'm going to respond to my pain, my understanding of the world. Rather than saying, God, I'm going to live in reference to what you say about these things and shape my life around them. This is the blessed life. Sam, you can come. Team, you can come back up. It says later in the book of Chronicles that Obed-Edom became a doorkeeper in the tabernacle of God. that he was promoted in life because of the way he stewarded the presence of God in his life. So much of our effort as people is into 
trying to get where we think we want to go in life, or even worse, trying to get in our own strength to where God says our life is supposed to go. When all he's called us to do is live in reference to his presence in us. And from that place, he will take you to places you have no business being in. You're looking at a man who does not deserve to be here right now. But all I did in my life is say, God, fine, if you want to use me, you can use me. It was the hardest thing and the costliest thing that I ever entered into. But as a result, I can proclaim to you with my wife and my kids and my church and my family that it is a blessed life. To simply believe in what he's saying about you. When you're faithful with little, God will make you ruler over much. Stop trying to climb your way to the top or organize your way through things. Submit to his presence, his leadership, his voice, and all will go well with you. All we have to do is ask God, how can I honor your presence in me? So I'm going to ask you a simple question today. Will you receive the presence of Jesus in your home?